Okay, um, so let me just give you an out, uh, outline of why adverse drug reactions are important, and Keith covered some of this. So we've undertaken some of the um, biggest studies in the world, epidemiological studies, which show that adverse drug reactions are a huge problem to NHS and all healthcare systems. Six and a half percent of admissions to our hospitals in adults are related to adverse drug reactions. In children, 2.9 percent admissions are related to adverse drug reactions. Um, and while you're in hospital, uh, you've been admitted with uh, whatever condition, your disease is changing, pathology is changing, your physiology is changing, doctors are, and, and pharmacists are changing your drugs um, to try to control your disease, 15% will develop uh, adverse drug reactions at any one time there. And we worked out that at this moment in time that there are 8,000 NHS beds occupied by patients with adverse drug reactions at any one point. And if each hospital is 800 beds, there are 10 800 bed hospitals equivalent of which are occupied by patients with adverse drug reactions with a huge cost to the NHS and a huge cost to industry as well. And the huge cost to industry has been shown by the systematic review by Jeff Aronson and his team. And he showed that between 1953 and 2013, 462 drugs were withdrawn post-marketing, often soon after post-marketing, uh, because of adverse drug reactions. The commonest reasons were hepatotoxicity, uh, immune-related adverse drug reactions, and cardiotoxicity. The cardiotoxicity was particularly QT interval prolongation, and there's been a big focus on that, obviously, in industry, and that's becoming less and less of a problem, actually. But in cancer, now some of the cardiotoxicity associated with newer cancer drugs is becoming a bigger problem as we move along. So adverse drug reactions can um, broadly be classified uh, into two types, which is on-target reactions, where there is a clear dose-response relationship. It is related to the known primary or secondary pharmacology of the drug. Um, and uh, when, if one reduces the dose of the drug, then one can actually um, try to uh, reduce the incidence of that particular adverse drug reaction. And here, pharmacogenomics may still have an important role because you can actually stratify by dosing in terms of what you give to patients. And precision dosing becomes important, and Richard will cover some of that. Off-target reactions is where we don't understand the pharmacology of the drugs, um, and as uh, um, we give the drug to the patient, they get a serious reaction which may involve liver failure, for example. We don't completely understand the dose-response relationship, but clearly there must be some kind of dose-response relationship because you wouldn't get the reaction unless you got the drug. As we understand more of the off-target reactions, we should be able to move um, adverse drug reactions from off-target to on-target as we understand it. And genomics will help us to start understanding some of the adverse drug reactions which are occurring out there. So, I, as, as people have already said, many factors predispose to adverse drug reactions. Some are related to poor prescribing that goes on in the NHS. Um, some are related to unforeseen drug-drug interactions um, and various other things. But, um, Genetics does contribute to adverse drug reactions, but the total contribution does vary according to the drug, to the disease, um, and the comorbidities of, uh, in the patient. And so what proportion of ADRs can be prevented by uh, implementing pharmacogenomics, we don't know at the moment. Some have suggested about 20-30%, but it's a very um, broad figure, very, um, I think, inaccurate figure. And we do need to collect the evidence, as Mark said, as we try to implement this. We need to collect that kind of evidence in an iterative fashion uh, as we move forward. So I think dose is very important. Paracelsus said this uh, you know, 500 years ago. Uh, the poison uh, isn't everything. No thing is without poison. Dose makes it either a remedy or a poison. Um, and we really haven't learned about you know, sort of this in terms of precision dosing. And I think one of the key um, things that will come across in the future is how we can actually dose precisely to get the best effect uh, in, in patients. And warfarin and anti-cancer therapies are key examples and they'll be covered uh, in other talks. So I'm not going to cover those uh, today. But what I'm going to focus on is, first of all, to give you some example of phase one um, enzymes and adverse drug reactions and then go on to um, the sort of uh, um, HLA uh, areas where, where we've been working on. So uh, if you look at phase one enzymes, uh, P450 enzymes, for example, but there are other phase one enzymes, um, if a drug is dependent on one particular P450 for clearance from the body, if you lack that enzyme, then you are likely to get accumulation of that particular drug and that causes toxicity. And so fractional clearance becomes extremely important. If a drug is only 50% dependent on metabolic clearance by 
one polymorphic enzyme, there will be 50% decrease in clearance and a twofold increase in half-life. Sorry, this is a bit of clinical pharmacology. I know not all of you are clinical pharmacologists in here. Um, <laughs> but I think that's important to understand that, that you don't necessarily just need 100% uh, change in somebody's clearance. You can have a 50% decrease in clearance and that can still tip you over the threshold to cause an adverse drug reaction. And if you can dose precisely, you can actually prevent uh, some of that. But, but this all changes uh, in the complex scenario in, we see in many of our patients now where they have concomitant drugs which can actually act as inhibitors. And I'll show you an example of that which can actually lead to fatal adverse drug reactions. So here's one example of where a drug needs um, one pathway for clearance. And this is something that has been known about since 1953 or so, uh, where you have a genetic or acquired uh, alteration of metabolism of drugs such as succinylcholine, uh, which is used uh, in anesthesia. And one in 3,000 people have a deficiency of the enzyme pseudocholinesterase or butyrocholinesterase. There are at least 65 known variants. And if these patients are given this particular drug, then you get prolonged paralysis and apnea uh, in these particular patients. And at the moment, you know, um, I'm not sure where I can get this kind of testing done uh, in the NHS. So let's look at cytochrome P450-2D6 and codeine. Here's an efficacy example, actually, where if you have uh, lack the enzyme um, and uh, codeine doesn't, 8% um, of the UK population probably lack the enzyme. So codeine doesn't work in them. And the Daily Mail has been very interested in this and has carried several stories uh, about this particular. Um, so more importantly, actually, with regard to adverse drug reaction, uh, is the ultra rapid metabolizer uh, phenotype. Um, many, uh, some people, 2% um, of the UK Caucasian population, and, but um, remember there are many different ethnic groups. Uh, in the UK, so if you're Ethiopian origin, 29% are so-called ultra-rapid metabolizers where they can carry 3 to up to 13 copies of the gene. And what happens is that if you give that particular drug, if it's metabolized by 2D6, then you'll get very low levels and you get lack of efficacy, and, and you wouldn't mention that. But if you have a toxic metabolite from that drug, you can actually get toxicity, and this has been seen with codeine. Codeine is a prodrug, it's metabolized to morphine. In cytochrome P452, these ultra-rapid metabolizers, you get higher levels of morphine, and that can lead to respiratory depression. And that certainly has been seen, and it's been seen in case reports, and there was a case report from Canada in a, 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 a child that was breastfed, uh, which was shown to be, an, uh, or the mother was shown to be an ultra-rapid metabolizer. Um, there was more morphine in the circulation of the child who was being breastfed and led to respiratory depression and death. And since then, there have been various studies which have shown that uh, there are clinical risk factors, uh, such as uh, being less than one year old, obstructive sleep apnea, obesity, etc. But twin studies have also shown there's 30% heritability in codeine-induced respiratory depression. Uh, in children. And deaths have been reported in case reports, nobody's ever going to do a randomized control trial here, uh, with uh, children post-surgically, particularly after tonsillectomy, who have been ultra-rapid metabolized, who unfortunately have died from receiving codeine. And if you look at the FDA data, 50 year spontaneous um, report data, there have been 64 cases of severe respiratory depression associated with codeine and 24 deaths under 12 euros. Now, that's, that's a great deal of underreporting in that system. So there's probably many more deaths out there occurring as a result of codeine. Because of this evidence, which was very observational, often related to case reports, both the FDA and the European Medicines Agency undertook regulatory action. That is to contraindicate the use of codeine post-tonsillectomy in anybody under the age of 18 and also below the age of 12 years for symptomatic treatment of cough. Now, you may say, well, that's a good thing to do, um, but the problem is that has caused problems in the NHS, for example, in pediatric practice, where codeine was perhaps the most commonly used analgesic. What do you go to? So people have gone on to tramadol, uh, gone on to morphine, and often we go on to more difficult drugs. Yet if we had genotyping available, we could actually make a choice when to give codeine to people and not to give codeine to people. And, and that might be a possibility to think about. Is tramadol. Tramadol is also metabolized by 2D6, but tramadol is not solely dependent on 2D6. It has other pathways, particularly 3A4, which is a major enzyme for metabolism of uh, tramadol. However, many people get concomitant medications. So if you get a concomitant medication, for example, clarithromycin or fusidic acid, 
Uh, that can inhibit your cytochrome P453A4. And if you're a poor metabolizer for um, uh, 2D6, that can actually result in toxicity. Now, it's very difficult to capture something like this in a randomized controlled trial. And you're likely to get that in case reports, and there are case reports of patients on a CYP3A4 inhibitor who are 2D6 poor metabolizers who've died from tramadol out there. Now, how do you actually capture that within, uh, within uh, 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 an evidence base? And so that's a challenge that's facing us, but actually it's an opportunity as well to be able to look at all sorts of evidence to be able to take things forward. So, but again, the biggest thing that's happening to us at the moment in this country, plus many other countries, is the changing demographics. As you get older, your renal function declines, your liver function declines, your respiratory function declines, your cognitive function declines, and your mobility declines. Something for all of us to look forward to, right? <laughs> so at the same time, you have multiple diseases, multiple organ systems are affected, and you're being given polypharmacy, 12 drugs plus that Keith mentioned. These patients have not been tested in clinical trials, right? But we're using the same drugs, same doses, uh, in the same way as we would do in a clinical trial setting. No wonder we're getting adverse drug reactions. So drug which is normally wide therapeutic index in a healthy volunteer or in a young patient in a clinical trial, in that scenario, suddenly becomes a narrow therapeutic index drug. Okay? And in that situation, when you have a very small effect of a polymorphism, suddenly in that population, it might become quite large. Okay, again, how do you capture that? How do you actually look at that uh, in clinical practice? Is an uh, opportunity we need to look at. Let me go on to the other aspect where we, there is much more um, evidence um, developing, which is the more serious types of adverse drug reactions, which are seen particularly where there's been a lot of data coming out on HLA. HLA, as you know, is the area in short time chromosome 6, which is responsible for determining how well your immune system works against infectious organisms but again, unfortunately also leads to problems in relation to adverse drug reactions as well. Um, and so work, first of all, in, has started many, many years ago, but actually the one that um, has really started itself was with Abacavir, with HLA-B5701, work undertaken by Simon Malala in Australia when he was there, now in Vanderbilt, um, uh, Seth Hetherington in U US, but also ourselves in the UK were able to show that uh, Abacavir hypersensitivity was very strongly related to HLA-B5701. We undertook cost-effectiveness modeling, um, and in 2004, we published this paper, um, and, and I got contacted by a lot of NHS clinics, HIV clinics, saying, can we use your data to be able to show how we might be able to implement pharmacogenomic testing for Abacavir in our clinics? By 2006, every HIV clinic in the UK was using HLA-B57 on testing. So two years to implementation. Wouldn't it be great if we could do that in many other areas? And the net effect has been dramatic. 7% incidence of hypersensitivity, uh, before testing, now less than 1% uh, in clinical practice uh, in the UK and many other countries where it has been implemented. We've been particularly interested in carbamazepine uh, in the Far East population. There is a very strong association with this particular HLA allele 1502 and carbamazepine induced Stephen Johnson syndrome toxic epidemic necrolysis. And a systematic review that we undertook, uh, which was uh, looking at studies at that time in Han Chinese, Thai patients, and Malay patients, showed that you know, all of them were positive uh, with regard to HLA-B1502, and the overall pooled, uh, old, uh, pooled odds ratio is about 113. Um, and this has been implemented in most drug labels now, so it is mandatory in the European Union to genotype for this particular allele if you have a patient of Southeast Asian origin. Now, how do you actually interpret that? What is a Southeast Asian origin patient? And that's quite difficult when a, when a clinician is facing a patient uh, in front of them. It doesn't mean that a Caucasian doesn't carry that allele, but the frequency of the allele in a Caucasian population is 0 0.001. So it is quite rare. So that's why, we don't, uh, that's why it wasn't actually indicated in a Caucasian population. In Caucasian populations, there's another HLA allele, which is A star 3101, which we described uh, in uh, 2011. And this, since then, has been replicated in Japanese populations, Chinese populations, South Korean, Canadian, and EU populations. The number needed to test to prevent one case of um, carbamazepine hypersensitivity is about 47. At the moment, the drug label actually says that you only need to do this, it's only there for information, it's not mandatory, yet 1502 is mandatory. So again, this kind of disjointed regulatory 
um, guidelines sometimes lead to inequalities when you may not need inequalities because if you have a white patient in front of you trying to prescribe carbamazepine, you'd give it to them. But if you have a Chinese patient, you'd test them first. So that's uh, introducing some inequalities, if you like. So if you look at um, the re reasons for this um, discordance in terms of how we uh, genotype for carbamazepine or what we test for, it relates to whether uh, population frequency of the, uh, is of the HLA allele. So uh, HLA A311 on, on the top slide uh, shows its prevalence throughout the world, yet if you look at 1502, it's mostly present, prevalent uh, in the Southeast Asian populations. In order to reduce some of the health inequalities, so I've been working with the CPIC group and Mary Relling leads the CPIC group and we've just produced a guideline which says that um, really for either of those particular alleles, you should not use carbamazepine, uh, but you should try alternative agents. If there is no, uh, for 3101 particularly, if you need to use carbamazepine, you should monitor the patients more closely. And that's one other way of using genomic testing. It's not just for prediction, actually it's stratifying monitoring. At the moment, a drug label will say, somebody takes a drug, you need to check their liver function every month. Actually, that's a waste on most patients. If you could stratify for those who are more susceptible, you could get them to come in for the monthly testing, while those who are less susceptible need to do it once a year. You reduce the um, burden on the NHS in terms of blood testing, but you actually reduce the inconvenience to the patient as well. So since the beginning of the century, there have been 24 different HLA associations shown uh, 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 with, with different drugs and different toxicities. Some of them are genome-wide significance, and actually it's more than that. It's probably gone up to 30 by now. Um, and the, the question is, we're never going to have randomized control trials on, on all of these. Most of the data is observational. Um, and so how do we actually start implementing that? And one way we thought about was by using a gene panel approach. So we got some funding from NIHR and worked with a company called MCD Diagnostics. And they had a patented technology called Mr. Spot. Um, and basically that has wells... Uh, uh, which are spotted with sequence-specific oligonucleotides, and you can then uh, type for people's HLA alleles, and uh, typing for HLA alleles is quite difficult, as you know. Sequence-based testing can be done, but it throws up lots of anomalies. It's very difficult to interpret sometimes and takes quite a long time as well. Um, so um, this particular uh, technology can give you results very quickly. And what we wanted to do, the aim was to develop a panel which would allow us to test in a cost-effective manner and provide the results in less than 48 hours. And that was the aim that we had for NIHR when we got the funding. So we have worked with this company and developed uh, this particular panel. And we've undertaken the analytic validation, first of all, of this panel. So we have uh, healthy volunteers recruited in Liverpool where we've sequence typed them for HLA. And we'll be able to then look at the analytic validation of this panel on this uh, uh, on this healthy volunteer cohort, 187 healthy volunteers, and the concordance uh, with the, uh, in terms of analytic validation was 100%, so the panel does work. But then actually when you look at our um, 24 HLA allele panel, and you look at the risk alleles individuals have, only 15% don't actually have any of the risk alleles I showed you on the previous slide. 85, 80 percent of individuals have at least one risk allele, and there's one poor individual here who has eight risk alleles. Now, the idea behind this panel is that you can do it as preemptively. So if you actually need to test for somebody at the moment because they're going to go on carbamazepine, you get the test result now, but you can actually store the rest of it on your, uh, on your electronic health record. As you get older, you need quite allopurinol, you already have that test available. If I need to do HLA testing at the moment in the NHS, it'll cost me anywhere between £50 to £200 to get the HLA done for a single locus test, it will take two weeks sometimes to get the result back. The idea behind this panel is it's going to cost £20 to the NHS for a 48-hour turnaround time. Okay, so that's the kind of things that we need to be able to stake into implementing things. Most people don't know how to impl uh, um, interpret HLA testing, so we developed a, a decision support system. And the decision support system looks like that. So if I want carbamazepine, I want to prescribe carbamazepine, I can just click on the carbamazepine logo there. Um, button and it will just come up with uh, telling me what the different alleles are associated with carbamazepine. I can click further in this and it will give me the CPIC guidelines, it will give me the Dutch pharmacy guidelines, it will give me the uh, FDA label and the European Medicines Agency label. It tells me what to do and uh, we give them uh, support saying you can either stop um, 
don't use the drug or monitor more frequently as in HLA-3101. So um, that's the sort of you know, you know, HLA area. People always say, well, I mean, you're developing quite a lot on HLA and HLA is um, uh, specific and you're not really showing anything on the non-HLA area. So I thought I'd show you something which is just coming out. It's, it's in press in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. It's due to come out in the next two, day, uh, next two weeks. Um, and this is related to children. Uh, children, um, the commonest disease in children which require medication is asthma. And children are given inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, inhaled corticosteroids are very effective, but, but relatively safe as well. But unfortunately, inhaled corticosteroids also lead to absorption of the steroid uh, into the bloodstream. And some kids develop adrenal suppression. The problem with adrenal suppression in kids is quite difficult to diagnose. Some of it may be just lethargy, not doing well at school, but some people do come in with Addisonian crises. So we, took, we recruited 525 kids. And all of them went underwent low-dose synactin testing. And we, what we found was that biochemically impaired adrenal response with a peak cortisol less than 500 uh, was, occurred in 37% uh, of individuals. Now, you could say, well, dose is a predictor. Well, actually, in our uh, model that we looked at, um, only 2% of the variability was predictable by dose or other pharmacological factors. So we, we hypothesized that there must be a genetic factor associated with this. So we've gone on to do uh, uh, GWAS on these patients. Um, and, and so we, uh, when we did this uh, in the kids with asthma, first of all, we found a signal on chromosome 11 uh, in a gene which is platelet-derived growth factor D gene. Now you may say, well, actually, is that, is that correct? But that, it, it just misses genome-wide significance. So we went on to replicate that. We replicated it in two different groups. Another uh, pediatric group uh, where we were able to again show uh, the positive association. But we then went on to adult group as well with COPD who were also getting inhaled corticosteroids. Now, COPD is a completely different disease. Um, these are elderly patients, often multiple, uh, multiple drugs. But we were also able to do synactin testing on the COPD patients and show uh, that those patients had adrenal, uh, has, uh, a proportion of those patients had adrenal suppression. And when we did the genetics on them, we were able to replicate the PDGFD association in that group as well. And when you put it all together, you find that uh, the odds ratio is 4.5 with a p-value of 10 to the minus 10. We also said, well, is this just related to the fact that your morning cortisol varies? All of our morning cortisols vary. Uh, you know, even, even when we're not getting uh, any kind of inhaled corticosteroid. So we worked with the Cornet Consortium, which has 24,000 people, where they've looked at GWAS together with the baseline morning cortisols, and there was no association between this particular gene and baseline morning cortisol uh, in, in kind of healthy volunteers. So we feel this is a true association, and we're now starting our journey on how we think we can implement this. So there's more work to be done. Um, so... This has never been identified in secondary, uh, in primary adrenal suppression before. Uh, it's not been identified in GWAS of asthma or COPD. Um, and, but it is highly expressed in the human adrenal gland. And, and its expression has been negative correlated with cortisol secretion in adrenal cortical adenomas. We're doing more mechanistic work. But one way to implement this, we think, is that kids need inhaled corticosteroid for the asthma. But actually, if you could stratify when you need more monitoring for adrenal suppression based on this polymorphism, you may be able to detect the adrenal suppression earlier and try to um, counteract it by uh, reducing dose, by um, undertaking other measures as well in those kids. So just to finish off, um, everybody relies on this evidence hierarchy in terms of randomized control trials, but I do worry that uh, this kind of uh, hierarchy is not really applicable to the, some of the things that we're looking at now uh, in genetics and genomics and pharmacogenomics. And so really the, some of the key questions we want to answer through the workshop is what kind of evidence is required for clinical implementation? For serious ADRs, um, the evidence will largely be observational, sometimes with very small numbers of patients, uh, akin to a rare disease. And what kind of evidence do we require there? Predisposition may occur in the context of complex clinical scenarios that I showed you there, with concomitant medicines in the elderly. Um, and so how do we actually take that into account? How does this all fit in with the regulatory processes? And how can regulation make sure that it's there, it's proportionate, um, but, but you know, it doesn't obstruct innovation as well? Um, 
and I think the important um, point uh, that you and also made is increasing number of patients will have pre-existing genomics data and how do we take that into account as well uh, when we start developing ways of being able to implement this uh, into clinical practice. So thank you very much for your attention.